Good evening, everyone. I'm John Moss from the National Museum of the United States Army. I'm in the Programs and Education Department, and tonight is our monthly Tuesday evening battle brief. And we're coming to you from Fort Belvoir. Uh, the topic tonight is Clara Barton and the Civil War. So we're going to see some, uh, some maps, some photographs, and talk about her Civil War career. Uh, we won't really cover much of her post-war career. Maybe that'll be another battle brief down the road, but we're glad to have you with us. So let's go ahead and start talking about Clara Barton. You can see here on our title page, we have two images of her. Um, and she was a, a nurse and a relief worker and an organizer and an angel of the battlefield, as she was called by some of the troops she got to know. Uh, most of you know her associated with the Red Cross, and she uh, was associated with the Red Cross for a long time after the Civil War, but she got her start in humanitarian efforts and relief efforts during the uh, war from 1861 to 1865. So Clara Barton was born in 1821 on Christmas Day. Uh, she was from Oxford, Massachusetts. And it turns out that when she did uh, begin to volunteer and then work for the Union war effort in terms of humanitarian relief and care of sick and wounded soldiers, she actually knew some of the men in the ranks from when she was a teacher and lived in Massachusetts. So she was always attached to the Massachusetts troops, uh, particularly the 21st Massachusetts Regiment uh, that she ran into several times during the war. Uh, she began working as a teacher, and uh, her she realized that uh, she would never advance much more than being a teacher, uh, even running her own school. The money was was meager, uh, even as a headmistress and and a very popular one. Her schools in Massachusetts and and uh, became very popular. But she decided in the about 1854 to move to Washington D.C. And there, she got a job in the U.S. Patent Office. And that was quite a, an unusual thing for someone to become a copyist in the Patent Office. It was basically a very skilled clerk uh, that, or administrative assistant that had a lot of responsibility. And she was paid equally uh, that men did, which was very unusual. And it was also unusual to see a woman in the Patent Office. Not everybody liked it. Um, and she became a little leery of the men she worked with. Uh, they discriminated against her, uh, name calling, things like that. They were not really interested in her being there in the office, but the money was good. It was better than she had when she was a teacher. When James Buchanan was elected as president in 1856, once he took office in 1857, uh, she lost her job in favor of a uh, someone who was a favorite of Buchanan. So she did not do that uh, very long with him. But then when Abraham Lincoln became president in 1861, she got her job back again in March of 1861. So she was a, a well-known person there to uh, the Republican Party and uh, was a, a Lincoln supporter and got her job back. This is the U.S. Patent Office where she worked on 7th Street in Washington, D.C., uh, Northwest. Uh, this is now the National Portrait Gallery. I'm sure many of you have been there, especially the local folks in the D.C. area. Uh, it's the same building. There was a patent office, and that's where she spent uh, several years working prior to the war. Uh, that is still, of course, standing, and folks can go see the portrait gallery there right near Gallery Place Metro. All right, let's move on to the next slide, if we could. Now, Civil War, uh, Fort Sumter uh, began early April 1861, and as a result of that, the Lincoln administration called for troops to come to the Capitol at Washington, D.C. As some of you know, Maryland was not considered to be a reliable Union state, which was a little on the awkward side because that would have meant if Maryland seceded from the Union, then the northern capital of Washington, D.C. would have been inside enemy territory. But Maryland did not secede, but there was a very strong uh, secessionist movement in Maryland. Uh, a lot of uh, 
people from Maryland supported slavery, supported the southern states. And so Lincoln called for troops to move into the uh, District of Columbia to secure the capital. On, no, on April 19, 1861, one of those units to arrive on their way to the capital, they arrived in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, it was the 6th Massachusetts Militia. And they were attacked uh, on the 19th in Baltimore. There were civilians rioting. Uh, several soldiers and civilians were killed, uh, wounded, uh, many injured. And uh, Clara Barton was, th this was her first uh, relief effort was to help treat the soldiers from Massachusetts, her, her home state, uh, when they were injured in the riots in Baltimore. Uh, that was the beginning of her relief work. This, this is a uh, image from the Library of Congress of the Baltimore riots. April 19th, 1861, and you can, you can see that it's soldiers versus attacking civilians, and uh, a lot of injuries and several deaths were caused by this riot. Now, she was not a trained nurse, so everything she was able to learn was self-taught by experience and working with others, observing doctors and other hospital uh, employees and nurses, but she was, she was not a, a trained uh, educated nurse, but um, again, she learned by doing. Uh, one of the first experiences that she had with major casualties was after the first battle of Bull Run on July 21st, 1861. So at the Battle of Bull Run, most of you know, this was uh, in Prince, current Prince William County, Virginia, uh, in Manassas, 25 miles west of the capital at Washington, D.C. And this was really the first major land battle of the Civil War. It was against green, uh, unseasoned troops, uh, very uh, inexperienced officers. Uh, it was a one-day battle that resulted, as most of you know, as a Confederate victory. And the victory was such that once the Union troops started retreating, it turned into a rout of most of them. Uh, many walked, ran, uh, did what they could to get back to Washington, D.C. Troops were coming in for days and days after the battle, and some of these were wounded. And so after the first Battle of Bull Run, uh, Barton was very involved with treating the troops. And this is where she started to uh, come up with a type of organization where she needed to get supplies, request supplies. And of course, at the beginning of the war, the logistical situation was such that the Union cause, and to a large extent, the Confederate cause also, were unprepared largely to be able to uh, support the troops logistically and in terms of medical care, medical transportation, and hospitalization. There just weren't that many facilities to be able to handle that in Washington, D.C., uh, or Richmond, for that matter. Uh, many of the Confederates uh, recuperated locally, but the Northern troops had to be brought back, the wounded and wounded troops and injured and the ill um, had to be brought back to the Washington, D.C. area in order to get treatment. And this is where uh, Clara Barton really started to figure out how to request uh, money and supplies and bandages uh, medical, any, any stretchers, wagons in particular, were always hard to come by. Um, she did this from the federal government, uh, but also back to Massachusetts. She tried to write uh, those folks she knew back home to get supplies and money, and particularly medical supplies, uh, to write to the various states to try to get uh, these things for, for their troops as well. Uh, eventually, as, as time went on, her organization became better. Uh, the, the medical departments in the capital became much more well-equipped, and they knew how to support people like the U.S. Sanitary Commission um, the, and, and other organizations like that, both private and public, but also Clara Barton as well. So this is where she, she got a, uh, one of her really tough experiences. She was not actually at the Battle of Bull Run, 
but uh, she was uh, she she did treat and help with the wounded in their care afterwards. Okay, let's check out the next slide. Um, one of the places Clara Barton found herself a lot was Fredericksburg, Virginia. And uh, when you, if you look at the strategic situation, uh, Fredericksburg is located halfway between the two capitals of the belligerents during the war, Richmond and Fredericksburg. It's also on a navigable river, the Rappahannock. And uh, there was also a railroad that ran from Richmond to uh, Fredericksburg as well. So it was a very strategic place uh, during the entire war. And so many times the Union troops or some Union troops were stationed at or near Fredericksburg. There was a Battle of Fredericksburg in December 1862 that we'll talk about in a few minutes. But here we have a look at the main place in 1862 and into 1863 where uh, Northern supplies for the Army of the Potomac and for other uh, entities, including hospitals, medical care, all came in to Aquia Landing, which is on Aquia Creek, uh, just just east uh, of Fredericksburg. So there's a uh, there's a place down there called Aquia now. There's really not much to see at the landing anymore, but uh, this was a very prominent place for shipping to come in. Uh, uh, to both bring in supplies, uh, take wounded uh, further north. Uh, Confederate prisoners were, were organized and, and transported from here to northern prison camps. So she came through here several times during the war uh, to be able to assist and help in Fredericksburg. So let's see the next slide. Now you'll notice she came in August of 1862 which was a very uh, momentous month in the history of the war in the East. Uh, the Union, uh, she visited Union hospitals in Culpeper Courthouse, Virginia, which is to the west of Fredericksburg. And there were several, there was a battle of Cedar Mountain on the 9th of August in 1862. And the wounded, uh, Union wounded from that battle were brought to Fredericksburg. And so, from that battle, uh, many of the wounded troops that Clara Barton was involved with uh, came from that battle. Now, this is a good time to mention to folks that Clara Barton worked for herself. She did not, uh, she cooperated to some degree with other entities who were trying to bring uh, relief to the soldiers. These are both uh, either governmental organizations or private charities, uh, things such as the United States Sanitary Commission and other uh, Christian relief organizations. But one thing that was that became apparent to others about Clara Barton when she was uh, doing her work well into her, uh, her her advanced years is she did not like to work with other people, especially if she if she was placed under their authority. She really uh, chafed at that. And so most of her relief efforts were uh, and were achieved uh, remarkably by her petitioning uh, the federal government and other relief uh, organizations in home states. I mentioned Massachusetts before, but uh, so when, when she is working uh, to bring relief, a lot of times she was collecting supplies in Washington uh, having them shipped to where they needed to be, uh, requesting money and, and, and wagons to be able to support her efforts to go as close to the battlefields as possible after the fighting stopped in order to get to the wounded as soon as possible. So in Fredericksburg, a lot of the wounded came from the Battle of Cedar Mountain, which is in Culpeper County, a uh, Confederate victory um, uh, that was uh, where well, the Confederates were led by Stonewall Jackson. Uh, however, the bigger battle that happened was the Battle of Second Manassas on 29 and 30 August of 1862. And here there were massive casualties of Union troops, a very heavy, uh, high number of wounded and Confederates too. Um, and many were brought to Fredericksburg or, uh, or at Culpeper. But this was a Confederate victory uh, where uh, Robert E. Lee and James Longstreet and Stonewall Jackson were the Confederate commanders. 
and uh, fought the battle under uh, which where the, where the Union troops were led by John Pope and Fitz John Porter. And again, this was a, this was a Confederate uh, victory. So after setting up some relief efforts, uh, she went on to return to Washington. Uh, if you follow her writings and her, her memoirs, uh, it's interesting to see that she is almost constantly shuttling between Fredericksburg, uh, places like Culpeper, Washington, Richmond. And she was a very, very busy person trying to get uh, these supplies organized um, and, and sent to the various places where, where they were needed. So uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is a wartime view of Culpeper Courthouse. Uh, it's located in Culpeper County between, between uh, uh, Charlottesville and Warrington and Manassas. Uh, this is what it looked like at the time that, that she was working in this area and setting up relief. Uh, if we go one more, uh, we can see a very uh, picturesque place. This is uh, f at Fairfax Station and St. Mary's Church. And this was taken about a month ago. Uh, the church is still standing. And uh, the original Fairfax Station isn't there uh, any longer. There's a post-war uh, railroad station. But at St. Mary's Church, the uh, Union Army set up uh, no, a number of hospital tents and convalescent tents, uh, any kind of building in this area that, that was needed. Uh, and, and it was all based out of the St. Mary's Church area where uh, Clara Barton spent some time there. So uh, it's right off the Fairfax County Parkway and 123, Route 123. So those of you who are local, you want to go out there and see it. It's a, As you can see, it's a very picturesque spot. But this was where she was known. There's also an historical marker out there uh, placed by the Red Cross to commemorate that. Now, a lot of the troops that were wounded were taken to Washington, D.C. So if we'll advance the slide one, there we go, thank you. Um, uh, we can see on the right is George McClellan, Major General George McClellan. And uh, he took over uh, the command of the Union Army in Northern Virginia, the Army of the Potomac, after the Battle of Second Manassas. He was brought in to uh, take command of the army. Uh, very well liked, very organized, um, and he was able to create uh, may, uh, some uh, number of hospitals all over Washington, uh, including this one here that you see on your left. That's the Armory Square Hospitals Complex. Uh, this is just one little snippet of it. It's probably the best picture uh, this is from the wartime. You can see the Capitol in the background. And this is actually part of it, uh, not necessarily these buildings, but part of what was known as the Armory Square Hospitals was basically where the uh, Smithsonian Air and Space Museum is today. It'll give you a little, little orientation there. But her efforts in this area, she worked in, she worked in, in these areas, volunteered, and... Um, was able to have a big impact. And again, not only just working in Washington, working in Culpeper, working in Fredericksburg, but also acquiring as much uh, as she could of military, hospital, and medical supplies, uh, relief for the troops, blankets, things like that uh, for the troops that she could. Now, after the Battle of Second Manassas, uh, the uh, military situation changed and there became a campaign uh, between McClellan, as you can see on the right, and Robert E. Lee, who, after Second Manassas, decided to invade the North. And he did so to give uh, the farms and plantations of Virginia a relief so that the farmers uh, and enslaved Virginians could have a chance to collect the harvest, uh, uh, be able to get a breather because up until this time, uh, the war had largely been fought on Virginia soil. And that was everything from Manassas, the Seven Days Campaign down near Richmond, uh, Cedar Mountain, the uh, Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1862, and the Campaign of Second Manassas, which ended in, in the end of August. So the uh, Confederates uh, crossed the Potomac River and were in the rough neighborhood of 
Hagerstown, Maryland, Sharpsburg, Maryland, Boonesboro, Maryland, in that area. And so the Northern troops under General McClellan, the Army of the Potomac, uh, gave chase, crossed the Potomac, uh, went by way of Frederick, Maryland, and started to move west to confront Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, which they knew to be in the Sharpsburg, Hagerstown area. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, the Northern troops of, the, of McClellan attacked the Confederates along a north-south running uh, mountain ridge called South Mountain. And on September 14th, 1862, with uh, overwhelming numbers because the Confederates had been spread out and were not expecting McClellan to move with speed against them, the Confederates who were guarding the gaps in the mountain were overwhelmed and McClellan was able to push them back and move toward Sharpsburg to the west. And this was really a victory for McClellan. It was one of the first victories in quite a while for the Confederates in the east because uh, they, forced McClellan, they forced Lee uh, and his troops back out of the mountains uh, toward the Potomac, which having a, a river in the background, in your back as a, you know, an army is dangerous. Uh, and it was unusual for McClellan to be able to move this quickly. Now, part of that came from the famous lost orders, uh, in which uh, troops of Indiana in McClellan's army found in a field wrapped around cigars near Fredericksburg, uh, excuse me, Frederick, Maryland, near, near uh, what's now the Monocacy battlefield. So the fighting took place here on South, in, in South Mountain. And then as we'll see in the next slide, three days later, was the momentous Battle of Antietam, September 7th, 17th, 1862. That was the, the most bloodiest day in uh, US military history because the battle was fought on one day in Sharpsburg, Maryland. And uh, if you know the area, uh, it's north northeast of Harper's Ferry, south of Hagerstown, and west of uh, Frederick, Maryland. Uh, both uh, the Army of the Potomac under McClellan, the Army of Northern Virginia under Lee, fought a very bloody back and forth one day battle uh, on the banks of Antietam Creek. Now you can see in this map, I have a star. Uh, this, the Battle of South Mountain that we just talked about, uh, Clara Barton and some assistants had gotten a couple or a few wagons and were able to follow the army as it moved west. And really that was one of Barton's main objectives was to be able to get as close as possible to the wounded troops so that they could be treated immediately. And she was able to secure wagons from the government and follow in the footsteps of the soldiers. Uh, the, the army knew that she was one of them, uh, one of the relief folks, and, and allowed her to do this. And uh, she was able to hear and see from a distance the Battle of South Mountain, but certainly came up to it uh, with the wounded on the ground and could see for the first time the aftermath of a battle immediately in its wake. Now in Antietam, she was actually on the battlefield, and you can see up on the top, um, you can see up on the top of the map where I have the yellow star, she was up on the top near what's called in the battlefield, the North Woods. And there's a marker there. She set up on a farm there and was able to, um, was able to get an aid station and to begin treating as soon as possible on the um, um, Poffenberger farm uh, right there where just to the right of the yellow star is the Poffenberg farm. Uh, that barn is still there um, and uh, it's part of the Antietam National Battlefield as well. So she, so this was really the first time that she was among the wounded and heard the firing and was in danger if, uh, from, from stray shots and overshots of cannon. Uh, this was a, quite a milestone for her. Uh, so if, if you visit Antietam, I go to the North Woods on the north end of the battlefield and you'll see a, a, a marker uh, that includes a red cross uh, made from bricks from the house where she was born in Massachusetts. 
Okay, after the um, after the Battle of Antietam and uh, Clara Barton eventually moved um, or or relocated back to Washington D.C., and then when the Army of the Potomac started to move from Culpeper, Virginia, where they relocated, uh, and by the way, I should mention for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the um, the Confederates lost the Battle of Antietam in that they had to. Uh, retreat across the Potomac River. Um, McClellan did not really pursue. Uh, he was sacked after the election by Lincoln uh, for being finally just too slow. And eventually Lee retreated uh, south of the uh, Rapidan and the Rappahannock River in the area of Orange and Gordonsville, Virginia. Uh, the uh, troops were uh, convalescing and trying to re, re Re, uh, refit, uh, heal from their wounds. And the Northern troops, now under General Ambrose Burnside, uh, who replaced McClellan in November of 1862, was at Culpeper. But soon the Union Army decided that they were going to uh, move and try to get a jump on Lee and cross the Rappahannock River at Falmouth uh, and, and Fredericksburg. Falmouth is across the Rappahannock River on, uh, on, the, on the northern side of the Rappahannock River. And if you've been in the area or familiar, the, uh, the I-95 bridge crosses the Rappahannock very close to Falmouth uh, in that area there. So anyway, uh, uh, Clara Barton eventually relocated to Falmouth, which you can see here. This is a wartime scene, a street in Falmouth. Uh, so it gives you an idea of what it looked like. Uh, now, if we can go to the next slide, eventually the uh, Burnside tried to cross the river. He did not get a jump on Lee due to logistical issues that we'll have to talk about in a different uh, battle brief coming up. Um, but, event, but Lee was able to maneuver down to Fredericksburg and prevent uh, the Union Army under Burnside from crossing the river as a surprise. So the Battle of Fredericksburg was a Confederate victory. Uh, the Union Army made some very uh, uh, attacks, blundering attacks straight into the Confederate lines who had had quite some time to dig in, uh, create artillery positions, and really occupy very, very good defensive positions. And um, Burnside's uh, army was suffered 12 or 13 casual 12 or 13,000 casualties Lee's army about 5500 to 6000 casualties but Barton was uh, in the area here in Fredericksburg and she would come back again but again as i said earlier um, when she was here in august this was this is really a common spot for her to do uh, her relief work uh, one of the places she did visit and was um, if we have the next slide was a very prominent house on the Union side, is called at the time the Lacey House, but this was built in the 18th century uh, on a bluff overlooking downtown Fredericksburg, across the river. Uh, this was known as Chatham. It was a house built by the Fitzhugh family, visited many many times by our friend George Washington. Uh, you can see uh, by the by the kind of ghost framework around the main door that it did have a two-story portico. So many of the images of Chatham uh, taken at the time of the battle show that portico there. And that's what it would have looked like when Clara Barton was there. But this is part of the Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania uh, National Battlefields and is the headquarters of the park. And it can it can be visited today. It's open to the public. So but after, once uh, 1863 rolled around, uh, as we'll see in the next slide, um, Clara Barton moved on to South Carolina. Uh, she went to South Carolina with her brother, David Barton, who had secured a position in the Army in the logistical branches and was stationed at Hilton Head Island. And that's where Clara set up her uh, tents and her equipment and her medical supplies. But uh, for quite some time, she wrote, uh, there really wasn't a lot of action going on that caused casualties, uh, which which she regarded as a blessing. But she was there for quite some time uh, over the winter of 1863. I mean, and in the spring and into the summer 
1863. And this was um, an area at Morris Island, uh, right near Charleston, South Carolina, and in the middle of the um, in the middle of the image there, that map that's an original map from the eight, from uh, July of 1863, was Fort Wagner. And this uh, fort was attacked by Union troops. Very heavy casualties. Uh, we have a picture of it. If we move to the next slide. Uh, we're not going to be able to go into the details much of this engagement, but this was where uh, the famous uh, attack by the 54th Massachusetts occurred. Uh, you can see on the left is Fort Wagner. Uh, this was taken after Union occupation, so some of the tents over there are likely to have been uh, medical tents or administrative tents. Now, the reason I have General Quincy Gilmore's picture here is that this brings us to another one of the more famous uh, incidents that was characteristic of Clara Barton's work is that she often clashed with the commander of whatever military department that she was involved with and, and situated in. And none more so than Quincy Gilmore, who quickly took a dislike to her. Uh, most accounts would probably say that they had a personality conflict and the Clara Barton liked to run things the way she wanted them run and didn't need interference with union officers who didn't know what they were doing in her mind. And she wanted as many wagons and supplies and tents and medical equipment and medicine that could be given to her. And that doesn't always work out. And this is a prime example of where that was not really the case of her getting along with the union commanders, which in hindsight, um, should have been one of the relationships that she worked to cultivate because ultimately that's where the, that's where the logistical support were, was going to come from. Now, eventually she went back to Washington, again, many trips back and forth to Washington uh, in early 1864. So let's move to the next slide. Um, in the beginning of May 1864, as some of you know, that was the onset or the uh, initiation of the famous campaign between U.S. Grant and Robert E. Lee called the Overland Campaign, starting uh, with the Union Army crossing the uh, Rappahannock and the Rapidan Rivers uh, to move south to Richmond, and they were opposed by Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. And this is why Barton moved back to the Fredericksburg area, because this campaign from early May 64 to mid-June 64 resulted in tens of thousands of casualties. And you probably recognize the names of the battles of the wilderness, Spotsylvania, Hanover, and the and um, uh, on the North Anna and Cold Harbor, and these were massive casualties, many of many of whom were treated at Fredericksburg. And this the picture on the right actually depicts uh, some soldiers who were in fact at uh, wounded at Fredericksburg. And this is a a scene of wounded troops at Fredericksburg. Um, now, at this time, interestingly, uh, uh, Barton wrote quite a bit about Belle Plaine, Virginia. This was near Aquia, but instead of on Aquia Creek, it was east of Fredericksburg on Potomac Creek, right near the mouth of the Potomac River and the Potoma, uh, Potomac Creek. Uh, this was where the Union Army started to build their logistical support uh, in 1864 instead of at Aquia. And Barton mentioned several times going in and out of Belle Plaine. Uh, it was muddy. It was very difficult to get in and out of. Uh, all the trees have been cut down, as you can see here. Uh, not much to see there today. It's uh, a little bit difficult to access, but uh, it's east of Fredericksburg, um, north of the Rappahannock River. But uh, it's a striking picture on the right that shows the uh, the wounded there. And that's really what Clara Barton's world looked like for much of of the Civil War from 1861 to 1865. 
Okay, next slide, please. So she moved into a new phase of her, um, her relief work and, and, and medical uh, uh, relief to the soldiers and the wounded. In 1864, in the middle of June of 1864, uh, Grant's army was able to hold uh, the uh, positions outside Richmond, but also swing the bulk of the army across the James River and uh, with the intent of, of taking Petersburg, which was the key rail junction south of the capital of Richmond. Now, they were not able to do that uh, in a sudden move and resulted in the nine month siege of Petersburg and Richmond, uh, which uh, Charles Bowery talked about in our battle brief in February. Um, Barton wound up going to a place called Bermuda 100, where there was a small semi-independent army under Major General Benjamin Butler. And she was able to see what things were, were, uh, what, what things were like there. And she was able to get quite a lot of supplies and relief and money because prior to moving to that area, Bermuda 100, which is between Richmond and Petersburg, uh, she had reported to Senator Henry Wilson and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton of the very deplorable conditions that the wounded were suffering in at Belle Plaine and Fredericksburg. Uh, they, were, they were out in the rain, the sun, bugs, uh, very little care, poor food, no shelter, and it broke her heart and, and others too that Union soldiers who were wounded in these battles were really uh, left with very little care at all. So she went to Washington and with Wilson's aide, who was a big supporter of hers, uh, they went and met with uh, Secretary Stanton uh, in the capital uh, of Washington, D.C., and eventually, by the time the uh, Grant's campaign against Petersburg uh, started, and she got down to Bermuda 100 to um, start organizing and, and taking care of soldiers there, the situation had improved quite a bit. One of the places she was at was, uh, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, one of the places she set up shop was a play, it was a hospital complex called uh, at Point of Rocks. And she was with the Army of the James in June of 1864. And again, this army was commanded by Major General Benjamin Butler. Uh, the image on the right is the uh, pre-Civil War home known uh, as the Plantation House at the plantation called Point of Rocks. And the image on the left, uh, some of the hospitals there in 1864. And this is where Clara Martin was set up uh, for some time. Uh, the uh, it's um, uh, again on the uh, James River. Uh, excuse me, it's on the Appomattox River, right near the confluence with the James River. So if we go to the next next slide, I'll show you where this is uh, on the map. So uh, at the bottom, you see City Point. That's where the James River and the Appomattox River uh, is um, it come together. The confluence and. I'll show you an image of City Point in a few minutes. Um, this is this is really basically by the the modern city of Hopewell today, Hopewell, Virginia. Uh, Richmond would be just north of this map, and Petersburg just south of this. Um, Bermuda Hundred was where it's the name of an old plantation um, that started in 17th century Virginia, uh, but this was where the Army of the James was. Uh, and again, Point of Rocks was where some of her hospital uh, uh, service was. And she did also come uh, in and out of Point of, of, of City Point. Uh, there was a railroad that went toward Petersburg from there. Okay, let's uh, start wrapping up here. We'll finish out her, her career in the Civil War. Uh, if you will, please go to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about what she saw. She actually got to the Petersburg area um, uh, from uh, Point of Rocks uh, on the day of the Battle of the Crater, which was the famous uh, Union mine that was blown up underneath the Confederate uh, uh, 
trenches, defensive positions. Uh, troops ran in uh, by the north, including um, U.S. colored troops, and it was a it was a big defeat. The Confederates were able to rally and uh, really slaughter a lot of troops, uh, poorly trained troops, which were also poorly led. But we'll also see in the next slide, she happened to be at Point of Rock, excuse me, at City Point uh, at, on the day of a gigantic explosion that was, um, was uh, initiated by Confederate uh, spies. Uh, they planted explosives in this area. And again, this area was just a uh, city point was filled with docks and explosives and supplies and ammunition. And uh, she, she actually was a witness to that when it exploded uh, after, only a week after the Battle of the Crater, really nine days afterwards. So um, she, was, uh, she was actually able to witness that. So let's move to the next slide. Now, another very interesting aspect of her career is that after after um, the surrender at Appomattox by Lee's army and the eventual surrender of all Confederate forces in the field, she made her way down with a, uh, an official commission to the infamous prison camp in Georgia, Andersonville. And she realized when she got there, and I'll, I'll just describe this briefly, but she realized when she got there that there were enormous amount of, of unmarked graves or poorly marked graves, bad record keeping, and um, she wanted to do something about that. Uh, she wanted to be able to be give the men who died at Andersonville and, and all over a, uh, a decent burial to recognize them and to make sure that the soldiers' families knew uh, where their loved ones were buried and could, could get any kind of pensions or last bonuses or paychecks, what, what, whatever it was. And this image is actually, you can see it only barely, but if you look on the right, um, up against the back tree line, you can see the American flag. And this was the flag raising over the new um, uh, National Cemetery at Andersonville, that, and, and Clara Barton was there at this ceremony. So she did have quite a, quite a career in the Civil War, traveled quite a bunch. Um, immediately after the war, and then we'll, we'll conclude with some questions, she wound up uh, continuing this effort to locate uh, the remains of missing men, find out where they were. And because many times the, there was no Red Cross at the time or, or an official Union Army agency that would notify the families back at anywhere from Maine to Minnesota uh, if their loved ones had, were killed in the Deep South or buried at Andersonville. There really wasn't any way to tell them until she created what she called the Office of Miss Missing Soldiers. And that was located at 437 and a half 7th Street Northwest. The building is still there today. So I encourage everybody to go see that. That's another interesting site in this area. And she actually helped locate more than 22,000 missing men and advise their family members of, of what happened. Uh, she also helped fund the burials of 20,000 Union soldiers uh, in the four years after the war. Um, and that really wrapped up the end of her uh, involvement in the uh, Civil War. So with that, I'm going to uh, try to answer some questions here. Um, uh, did the Union hold parts of what is Virginia, such as Fredericksburg and Culpeper? Uh, yes, the back and forth during the war at various times, uh, the Confederates were in Culpeper or the Union troops were in Culpeper. In fact, the uh, Burnside moved toward Fredericksburg in 1862 from camps in Culpeper. Um, Prior to the Gettysburg campaign, the before the Army of the Potomac started moving north, they were in Culpeper, uh, and also Grant uh, took over the Army of the well took over all the forces, but but moved with the Army of the Potomac uh, from Culpeper. And of course, the Confederates also had it for quite some time, uh, even even before Gettysburg as well. So. Um, 
let's see some other questions here i'm having a little trouble with my computer reading them um okay you said that clara barton was self-taught do you have any details about her training was she viewed as medically competent that's good very good question um i did research prior to the, tonight's program there was no real, really a, a nursing career path at that point. There were people who worked in hospitals, uh, but there were no wide, no real nursing schools. So um, much of what she learned, she learned from experience. Um, uh, she was one of the first to recognize uh, the need for cleanliness and hygiene in the camps, because a lot of these soldiers died from illness uh, more than they did from bullet wounds and and bayonet wounds during battle. Uh, an interesting story uh, about this is that uh, she, um, when she was in her young teens, one of her brothers fell off a scaffold or a roof, I can't remember which one, and severely injured his head. And she moved in with him in order to nurse him back to health. And after many, many months, she was able to, uh, he was able to regain complete uh, function and movement and um, no real long-term residuals. So that really kind of started her on her, on her medical, on her medical path. Um, okay. Another question, uh, what was her family situation? So her mother died in her teens, which is about 12. Uh, the way it was portrayed in her autobiography written many years later, which is not always reliable, uh, and, and letters and things like that, a diary, was that um, the, the household broke up, meaning, excuse me, her father, uh, she went to live with an older sister, uh, some of the other siblings um, had already been married, um, but that's kind of how her upbringing was her family situation. Then once she became a teacher, she uh, eventually lived on her own. Um, now, who did Clara Barton uh, coordinate with to arrange to provide care for soldiers in the field during the Civil War? So um, part, it came from several different places, much of which was private donations. Uh, her writing back to people she knew in the North, but also politicians and as I as I pointed out in the uh, slideshow, she was able to get sponsors and supporters like Senator Henry Wilson, folks like that. She did get some uh, army aid, uh, particularly in the form of wagons, to be able to transport her medicines and supplies and tents and things like that. Um, so uh, that's where she got a lot of it. She was a hustler, and she was that's kind of one of the reasons why I think she became known as being somebody somewhat irritable and irritating to the Union generals who didn't really want to deal with her is she was constantly requesting and bargaining for and negotiating. Um, so um, that that's a good, uh, kind of a good way of, of, of answering that question. I hope it does. Um, let's see, we got a time for a few more. Uh, what about after, the war okay um well after the civil war she actually now remember the american red cross wasn't founded until 1881 so that left about 15 years and some for other for her career prior to even becoming the president of the american branch of the society um, one of the things she did uh, was she helped out the german army in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 to set up uh, military hospitals in, a, in, a, in a, an efficient way based on her experience. And um, she was in, con in contact with the, uh, uh, the German uh, government and the, and the royal family in uh, uh, Germany. Uh, she also was in charge, well, she also contributed to the public distribution of supplies to destitute people uh, of the Paris siege, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Paris Commune, which ended 1871. And interestingly, she was awarded the Prussian Iron Cross for her efforts in helping to treat wounded from the battlefield. 
Um, so I mentioned the uh, Red Cross. Okay, another question, did Clara help set up hospitals in Frederick, Maryland? She did uh, provide support and relief in Frederick, Maryland for a short period of time, but remember that was when she was on her way following the army and uh, went through the, the South Mountain battlefield. And then three days later on September 17th, the Antietam battlefield. One of our statements here is uh, she also aided refugees and prisoners uh, during the Spanish-American War uh, to the point where in Cuba, the people of Santiago uh, built a statue in her, in her honor in their town square, which is still there today. So she, was, she made quite an impact. All right, she wound up um, becoming uh, the president of the Red Cross. The Red Cross headquarters is, is in what is now the uh, Clara Barton National Historic Site uh, up in Maryland, just across the uh, just across the river from Virginia. And that is a great site to see. There's a lot of fun things to see up there, very interesting. So I encourage people to go up there. So uh, let me thank our producer, Kenna, for her uh, efforts tonight. Always appreciate that. I want to thank also our audience. As always, uh, thank you for participating. It's been fun talking about Clara Barton uh, with you, and I hope you enjoyed it. And with that, I'll say good night and see you next time. Thank you.